Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for coming. This um, Sunday night will be a very special day in the Jewish calendar. It's called Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av. And uh, it really comes out on Shabbat, but we don't fast on Shabbat. So we push it off until Sunday. It is a uh, 25-hour fast. There are only two fasts that we fast for 25 hours. Out of the six fasts that we have, again, four for the destruction of the temple. One uh, that we have also is the uh, fast of Esther, fast of the Bechorim, which we don't fast. Many people don't. They make a Siyam. And Yom Kippur, which is the only one that's Torahic. Again, Yom Kippur is 25 hours. And during those 25 hours on Tisha B'Av, there is five prohibitions that we have. There is no eating, no drinking, no washing of the body. Uh, again, a person in the morning can wash his hands, negelvasa, when you get up, but only up to the knuckles. Um, again, if your hands are dirty or whatever, a woman has to, in the afternoon, prepare food, especially for children. Again, you can use water, but at base there's no washing of the body. Uh, also, leather shoes. That means not just leather soles, leather tops as well. Uh, again, you can wear a leather belt, a leather yarmulke, a leather jacket, but no leather shoes in any way, shape, or form. Also, marital relations. Um, Tisha B'Av really finishes off the uh, end of the three weeks that began with the fast of the Shabbos or Batamas, again, which all deal with the destruction of both temples. They were destroyed during this period of time, and um, there are many things that happen in the month of Av. Again, the month of Av is considered to be a, a difficult time for the Jews up until the 15th. And then amazingly on the 15th it becomes some of the happiest times, which is not unusual for us as Jews. As when the world was created, God said, the Arab, the Boker, and it was evening and it was morning. That the Jewish, ca the Jewish calendar goes from night to day, the secular calendar from day to night which is an allusion to the fact that we as Jews always are hopeful, always looking forward, always seeing things in a positive way. The glass is always half full. That no matter what happens to us, it always goes from night to day. That there's always a bright light waiting for us. Again, we have a Father in Heaven that always protects us. And we'll be talking about how that fits in with our... Actually, a celebration of the Tisha B'Av in the sense that it really will bring in, hopefully, the coming of the Mashiach, of Tzikainu, of our uh, the Messiah, at the end of time. Um, again, Spanish Inquisition, the expulsion from Spain happened on Tisha B'Av, uh, World War I or II, again with uh, Poland. There are many calamities that happened throughout history on the 9th of Av. It has not been a fun time for the Jewish nation. Where does this all come from? So. In the infancy of the Jewish nation, it really connects, to, we are very much connected as a people to our past. The only reason why we are Jewish is because of our connection to our forefathers, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they, God chose us because of our grandparents. Just that simple. Um, God had us enslaved in Egypt for 210 years. And then he took us out of Egypt and uh, brought us out into the wilderness, into the desert. And that's our connection, again, to the infancy of the Jews in the desert. In the desert, the first major sin that they did was the making of a golden calf, 40 days after they received the Torah on Mount Sinai. And what did the golden calf teach us? Basically, the concept of tshuva, of repentance. Many people think the Jews didn't enter the land of Israel because of the making of the golden calf, which is not true. The Jews made the golden calf, and God forgave them. And in fact, when the Jews left Egypt, there were numbered at 603,550. Now, they only needed 600,000 men between the ages of 20 to 60. Why the 3,550? There are those who say that they were really the walking dead. They should have died in Egypt during the days of darkness. Why were they brought out to the desert? And the answer is, there's a saying in Hebrew that says, Ain't Shmiya Korea. Hearing something is not like seeing something. 
So God brought 3,550 individuals that are on death row out to the desert so that the Jews can see that there are consequences for actions. You know, when a parent threatens a child all the time but does nothing, it's useless. The child knows it's just words. And the child continues to do whatever he does. The parent punishes the child. All of a sudden, gets the child's attention. That he knows it's not just words, but it means something. So what God did, he didn't want to wipe out the nation, per se. So he brought out these members, these people on death row, so to speak, that should have died during the days of darkness. And whenever there was a difficulty, during the eagle, for example, it says, who died? Kishloshe Salafim, like 3,000. It doesn't say Shloshe Salafim. Why Kishloshe Salafim? Because they're already dead. They, God just made them an example in the desert. As we know, the tribe of Don served idols for the whole time they were in the desert, and yet God did not destroy them, the tribe of Dun. Not only that, the Jews went to battle against Amalek because of them. So we see that God never wants to really destroy the, the sinner. What he wants to do is destroy the sin. God is always in attendance, much like a parent. Now when it came to the Miraglim, to the spies, that's where the catastrophe began. And this is where we go back all the way in history. That when the Jews sent the spies into the land and they came back with a negative report and the people cried in their tents and really wanted to stay in the desert, God gave them what they wished for. He had them stay in the desert for the next 38 plus years. Why? What's the difference between the eagle and the Miraglim, the spies? One major difference was with the eagle, the Jews admitted they had sinned. They asked God for forgiveness. They repented. But the Miraglim, it says, what they said was, if God said we sinned, then we sinned. We'll accept what he said. Not that they believed that they had. They're just accepting God's opinion. That's not tshuva. That's really a whole different game. So the Miraglim taught us this idea of consequences. Because of that, they didn't enter the land. Now, this is also, Tisha B'Av is also connected to the future just like it's connected to the past with the sin of the, of the Miraglim, of the spies. Because we know that Mashiach is supposedly supposed to be born on Tisha B'Av. So again, our salvation and our great punishments come with Tisha B'Av, both sides. Which is not unusual, again, with our relationship. Then how does God punish us? So he punished us for, making, for, not, for crying in our tents, our forefathers, and not wanting to enter the land. What was the punishment? The punishment was, was that they would wander in the desert for the 40 years that they, after they left Egypt. But it's amazing. It was a punishment given by a benevolent father to his children. Without that punishment, we would not be who we are today. That punishment was the greatest blessing that we could have had. Imagine if the Jews had followed the itinerary that was given to them when they left Egypt. They would have been into the land of Israel in the beginning of the second year. They would not have learned the Torah from Moshe. In fact, Moshe would have died because Moshe was not entering the land. They would have gone into the land of Israel not as Talmini Chachamim, not as people who were the people of the book that knew Torah, that understood it. Because after all, for 40 years, what did they do? The month fell every day. They didn't have to harvest or plant or do anything that, that was agricultural. Their only job was basically to study Torah. We became the people of the book because of that. Because of this punishment that God gave us. For 40 years, they were able to witness the mun falling every day, the well of Miriam, the sea of water following them, and surrounded by the clouds of glory. To say that you can't prove there's a God in the world is ridiculous. Of course you can. Because they eyewitnessed it for 40 years. Three generations saw that. And the Gentile nations around them also saw this 12-mile cloud that traveled through the desert. And the remnants of all of the trees and produce that the Jews left when the cloud moved. Because when you have a sealed environment in the desert, and you have water, what you have is things growing, like a flash flood. So the, how, the way that God punished us was to give us the greatest benefit of all. Not only that, what was their punishment? They would all die in the desert. Sh sad thing. But they would die at the age of 60. That sounds to us today 
to be pretty young. And today it may be. But you should know that in 1907 in the United States, the average lifespan of the American male was 47 years old. These people lived to the age of 60. Not only that, go into a hospital. Tell someone that he can move on to the next world with no more pain. You're going to let him stop suffering. He will kiss you and hug you and thank you and bless you. No one was sick in the desert. They didn't die from illness. Every tish above, every tish above, and the ninth above, all of the people of that generation would dig graves in the desert and sleep that night in the graves. In the morning, Moshe would call out, let the living separate from the dead, and every year some 15,000 died. In fact, the last year when they thought that they would have the last of them die, they realized that God had counted from the second year, not the first, as those that were 20 years old and those that thought they were going to die, that amazingly, that, morning, that next day, they were alive. And they stayed in their graves up until the 15th when the moon was full. And that's why the 15th of all became a day of celebration to see that God had totally forgiven them. So the punishment was very measured in what it does because God always is that way. And the question becomes, so God destroys the temple. We have four fast days that commemorate the destruction of the temple. It's called the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, the fast of the tenth. The fast of the fourth is the 17th of Thomas. Again, when Moshe Rina came down from the mountain with the second set of luchos and broke them. The fast of the fifth is Tishabov in the ninth, in the fifth month, the ninth above. The fast of the seventh is Sum Gedalia on the third day right after Rosh Hashanah. And the fast of the tenth, the tenth of Tavis. But where was God? Does God really abandon us? Does a father abandon his children? The answer is no, never. But where was he? And the answer is, add up the numbers. Fourth month, the fifth month, the seventh month, 16, the tenth month, 26. The the numerical value of God's name of mercy. God is always behind the scenes, looking at us, watching us, caring for us. In fact, when we talk about Yira Shemayim, HaKol Bidei Shemayim, Chutz Mi Yira Shemayim, everything is in the hands of heaven except the fear of heaven. So what we think about is that we're supposed to fear God, but what kind of relationship is that? Imagine you fear your father. Is that a relationship? You should love your father. You should be in awe of your father. Love and awe is good. Fear is the lowest level that you can have. Fear comes with no knowledge at all. Love and awe come with great knowledge. And that's what God wants from us. Not just to love him, but also to be in awe so we balance off that affection we have for him without getting too close like Nadim Abil. We have there are parameters in everything. So we see that God's presence is even in the worst of times that God's presence is there. Amazing story told of Napoleon. That Napoleon was going through um, Paris and he passed a synagogue and he heard crying, wailing coming from the synagogue. And he sent one of his agents, one of his officers to inspect to find out what was going on. And the officer came back and told Napoleon, the Jews are crying over the loss of their temple. So Napoleon said, when was it destroyed? And they said, some 1,500 years ago. And Napoleon said, this is a nation that is destined for greatness. Nobody does this. People deal with maybe yesterday, but 1,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago? And the answer is yes. Because our whole existence is based on the connection to our forefathers. We are part of a chain. And each link in the chain is crucial. If one link in the chain is weak, the whole chain is weak. That's what makes us who we are, this connection to God through our forefathers. So how, how do we understand this? Especially today. With the Holocaust, which everybody asks about, where was God? How could God allow it happen? With the, what goes on in the Middle East today with Gaza, with the West Bank, with the terrorists, where's God? There is a capital to Hill in the third uh, Psalm, in the book of Psalms, that opens up with the term Mizmor Ledavid, 
a praise, a song of King David, Bevorcho Bimne Avshalom Beno. When he was when he was fleeing, when he was running away from Avshalom his son. Avshalom his son tried to abduct him to to take over the uh, kingdom and to uh, basically remove his father, even kill his father. Why would he have a song, Mizrael the Dub, why would he praise God because of the fact that he was being chased by his son, Avshalom? You don't praise God for that. The answer is yes. How do we understand it? See, David and Melech was told by God that after this, his relationship with, uh, with Bathsheba that there would be consequences. And the consequence would be there would be a rebellion that would come out of his house. And that's all God told him. David didn't know where the rebellion would come from. He thought it could be a slave, could be a worker, a servant. And they would come with cruelty, fierce cruelty. When he saw that the rebellion was going to come from Absalom, his son, that was unnatural for his son to try to take the throne and to try to kill his father is not a natural thing. So we have a precept. Then when God deals with us in a natural way, that means what he said is, that's it, I quit. I don't want nothing to do with you. Much like the nochash, like the snake, primordial sin, and when, when God, uh, with, with the story of Chava, with the snake in the Garden of Eden, what God told to the nochash was, you can eat from the dust of the earth, You'll always have what he, don't bother him anymore, I never want to see him. He cut his relationship with the Nachash. That's natural. When Absalom was the one who was trying to abduct, the, the, uh, to take the throne and to kill his father, that is unnatural. Which made David and Melech sing, Mizmar the David. Why? Because it meant God was still there. As long as God was still in attendance, he still had a chance. The last country that, even, this, even with the Spanish Inquisition, when the Jews were expelled from Spain, the Jews were a big benefit to Spain. The Barbanel was the finance minister, and yet nothing could be done. Because, again, it was not, should not have been done, but it was unnatural. The last country in Europe that should have perpetrated the Holocaust, the last country, was Germany. Germany was the first country in Europe to allow Jews to go to, to university, to get a higher education. Spinoza wasn't religious, but if you look, he went to yeshiva. Why? Because the only form of a higher education that a Jew could get was to go to yeshiva. They would now allow them into a secular university. Most of the concentration camps were in Poland. The Polish hated the Jews. The Germans didn't. This somehow became a, a logical thing to them. There's no way in the world you could have proved the Holocaust unless it was Germany. No one kept the records that the Germans kept. If any other nation had perpetrated that crime, the Holocaust, we couldn't have proved it. The Germans were very meticulous. Everything about it was unnatural because God was there. When a woman gives birth to a child in Gaza, and they take her to a hospital in Israel because there's complications. And she straps a bomb onto herself and her newborn child. That is unnatural. God is in attendance. Mizmar Ledovit. Bevorachem Nevesham Bono. So yeah, Tisha B'Av is here. And yes, we need to fast. But we need to know is that God Almighty is still in attendance. That he has not abandoned us. That what he wants for us to do like every parent wants. Just be good. Just do what you have to do. What a beautiful life we have when we follow the Torah. We are better people. We are better friends. We are better husbands. We are better fathers. Every, anyone can see that. It's a better way to live. It's a kinder way to live. In a world that we live in with so much chaos, with so much hatred, with so much bitterness. Why? The temple was destroyed because of that, because of sin of chinam, baseless hatred. Our job is just to do the opposite, to have avas chinam, baseless love. Just love people. 
Rabbi Kiva says the whole Torah is really based on one verse and one verse only. The Ahafta L'Riach Kamocha, to love your neighbor as yourself. It's interesting. You love yourself whether you're good or bad. You love yourself whether you have a reason to. You don't have to prove to yourself why you should love yourself. You just love yourself. Even if you're not what you should be. We don't need to judge people. We just need to love people. And think about it. A fast day. We are the only nation that can fast for 24 hours, 25, and put on 5 pounds. And during the whole fast, all we're thinking about is food. Now, there's, we eat a big meal before the fast. During the fast, our cupboards are filled with food. There are restaurants and there are supermarkets to get all the food that you want. And yet, we're in a panic. Imagine a person who doesn't have a cupboard full of, shoes, of food. Imagine a person who doesn't have the money to go to the supermarket or go to a restaurant. When you are on his situation, when you have the food but you can't eat, you feel pain. Well, guess what he feels? Pain with no hope. You have hope and you still feel pain. There are people in their whole lives that never miss a meal. Not a meal. Forget about eating for a day. By fasting, at least we have some compassion, hopefully, for the misery that some people have. And it's our job to take care of these people so that they don't, they don't have a complaint to God Almighty, Almighty, our Father in Heaven, that they, God does not take care of them. We are His children. It's our job to take care of it, to show that there's a God in the world that cares. There's more to fast. There's more to the fast day than fasting. What we need to do is connect to what the real meaning is. To try to make the world a better place, to come close to our Father in Heaven. I'd like to end with a quick story. There was a Murano, a family of Muranos. Muranos again were the secret Jews in Spain, that were hid from the Inquisition. And this family had elderly parents, and when the Jews were expelled from Spain, of either converting or leaving. They stayed. They stayed because of the elderly parents. But secretly, they kept all the mitzvahs in the Torah. Outwardly, they were Christians. And their parents died. And they were told by a friend that the Inquisition had found out that they were keeping Torah, keeping mitzvahs, acting as Jews secretly. So in the dead of the night, they secretly ran and wound up in a tent city in Portugal. And while they were in that tent city, the man's wife died. An ep epidemic broke out and he lost his eldest son and his middle daughter and then his youngest son. And after he buried his last child, he looked up to heaven. And he said to God Almighty, he said, I know you're testing me to see if I love you. So first you tested us with the Inquisition. But we remained strong and we still served you. And then you tested us with the fact that they were going to kill us. And we ran to Portugal. And my wife died. I still loved you. I still believed in you. And as I buried each one of my children, even little Chaimel, I still trust in you. I still love you. The way I see it, there's only two things left. My life and my love for you. And my life is yours. That you can take. But not my love for you. I am a Jew. I was born a Jew. I will die a Jew. And not even you, God Almighty himself, can take that from me. We need to know that. We need to know who and what we are. We need to stand up. We need to be counted. We need to make the world a better place, one by one. Don't think that it doesn't make a difference. Change yourself and you'll change the world. Use this as an opportunity. And that's what God means it for. For us to take an accounting of what and who we are. To hopefully make the world a better place. So that Mashiach Tekenu can come quickly in our time. And with that, there can be peace in the world and only goodness. Thank you very much. Have an easy fast. God bless you.